Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Premium Podcast Episode number 238. It is February of 2020, and oh my, I'm excited about today's episode because I love genealogy, I love mysteries, and I love puzzle solving. Are you with me on that? (laughs) I bet you are. Oh my gosh, we have not one, but two tales of mystery, and one, very appropriately for this month of February, has a Valentine's theme. It's centered around a mysterious love letter professional genealogist Kathleen Ackerman is going to be here to share how a love letter that was missing its last page took her on a genealogical journey full of surprises. And uh, you'll hear how she solved the mystery and maybe you'll hear some techniques that you can use in your own genealogical research. And our second story is one of mystery, of twists and turns that I think will ultimately resurrect your faith that What you think is lost may still be found. So stay tuned. And I have a big announcement for you at the end of the episode. So you'll want to listen all the way to the end. But of course you do, right? (laughs) I hope so. But before we go any further, I want to mention some news that's been coming out recently here in the first few months of 2020. You may have seen some articles recently about some of the changes happening in the DNA market. Now, one of the first articles I saw was that 23andMe laid off 100 employees due to slowing DNA kit sales. Vox.com reported on that on January 23rd of 2020. And of course, 23andMe is one of the most popular DNA testing companies. They do not only your ancestry testing, but also they offer health-related tests. Well, this article says that uh, they are laying off 100 employees, which is basically 14% of their workforce, as consumer demands for the kits weaken. And they said it was due to a variety of factors, including privacy concerns, and they think that that's what's been contributing to the slower market. But it was interesting because the CEO of 23andMe says, quote, this has been slow and painful for us. And she added that she was surprised by the decreased demand for the company's DNA tests. And I find that interesting because I'm not that surprised by this. I kind of expected, we we knew that there was a demand within the genealogical community for DNA testing because it's another tool in the toolkit. But for the general public, you know, it's a pretty big price tag considering that they kind of just look at the ethnicity results and... And that's it, you know. So I can see how there would be a limited number of people within the general public who would be interested in paying the price tag for what they consider to be fairly simple test results. You know, a lot of them don't even realize there's matches they can look at and and they're not interested themselves in genealogy, which, of course, explains why so many people either don't have a family tree uploaded to their profile and they don't respond to inquiries. So that's interesting. And and I think that this is going to mean 23andMe is going to have to do some readjustment. This is, I think, why the health testing has become more popular, because I think these companies saw the slowdown happening last year in 2019. It was starting to trickle off. We certainly saw that at genealogy conferences. Gone are the long lines of 100 people waiting to buy a test kit. That just doesn't happen anymore. So... I think it's going to steer them into the direction if they want to stay in the genealogy ancestry market, they're going to have to come up with some additional tools and maybe charge for those tools, which some of them have started doing in order to be able to kind of make up the revenue difference. So after this article about 23andMe came out, then yes, sure enough, February 6th of 2020, I know that genomeweb.com reported this as well as many other news outlets The article was Ancestry lays off 6% of employees due to consumer slump. And it says here uh, it's because of a downturn in its Ancestry DNA consumer DNA testing services. The CEO said in a blog post that the company had seen a slowdown in consumer demand across the entire DNA category 
over about the past year and a half. And I would say that's kind of what we've been seeing just out and about at the various conferences and events. You know, you can just tell that there's a difference. I don't think there's a slowdown in the interest in the genealogy community in terms of how to make use of the results they got, but there's definitely a slowdown in the purchasing. And of course, when that happens, then the companies that make these tests have to rethink how they're going to continue with their revenue. So it's it's interesting because we all love to see uh, further advancements and things, but of course it has to be profitable to to kind of shore that up and make that possible for them to continue to pursue. It says here, Ancestry rolled out its Ancestry DNA service back in 2012. Of course, it was the market leader with more than 16 million people tested. But the CEO says they think they've reached an inflection point as most early adopters have already taken its tests. And of course, they're suffering from, I think, the same thing that 23andMe did, which is there is a limited genealogy market and there's a limited public market in terms of those who'd be willing to pay. And we saw that in the price, didn't we? Those prices really fell this last year. The article goes on to quote the CEO saying future growth will require a continuous focus on building consumer trust and innovative new offerings that deliver even greater value to people. I imagine those offerings could be different types of testing, which is like getting more into the health arena. It could also be added value in terms of tools, perhaps maybe tools that you pay for separately that can tell you maybe more and dig more into your DNA results if they have that kind of technology. She goes on to say, we're just starting to see the full potential for how genetics impacts health. (laughs) So I do think that is the focus. She says the company will also renew its focus on its online family history business, which could mean, you know, moving away from kind of what has been the cash cow of DNA kit sales and maybe uh, doubling down and, and adding more value and more tools on the genealogy side, which, of course, I think would be wonderful as exciting, as interesting as DNA is, it's it's actually, a, I think, a fairly small slice of the whole genealogy experience. And I would love to see more records, more tools, more analysis tools, um, and other, you know, kind of innovations that can help us be more successful overall in our genealogy research. So that's the latest in the DNA arena. And I think uh, one thing that we know for sure is that change is an absolute given, isn't it? (laughs) Things just keep changing. And there's so many different factors, putting a bit of pressure onto the marketplace. So it'll be really interesting to see how this develops. Speaking of DNA, in our mailbox segment, our first question centers around DNA and also genealogical records. So we'll be taking a look at that next in the mailbox. Well, here in the mailbox, uh, Frank recently wrote in and he says that he listened to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 227. And that featured my conversation with Rand Sneer, my heritage DNA product manager, about their genetic genealogy tools, the theory of family relativity, and auto clusters. And this got Frank thinking about his own test results and a frustration that he's been having to find matches and records in pursuit of his Galician roots. And he writes, Ancestry's records are almost non-existent except for some parish records, but this is the region from which Cuba and Argentina were populated and the ultimate ancestry of Cubans in the U.S. I have done the Ancestry DNA test, but my matches are few and far between. On the other hand, I've worked with a Spanish genealogist and have some records that go back to the 17th century. Is there any program like Ancestry, 23andMe, or MyHeritage that can do Galician, which is Spanish, genealogy well? So the way I would tackle this is, of course, the first thing is on the DNA side. I think the important thing to remember is that DNA companies test all types of people right? They don't typically say we're going to focus on this area or that area because they have no way of knowing when they test somebody uh, what their background is going to be. So they really cover the whole gamut. Wherever people are from, that's the results they show. So they don't typically really target particular regions. Now they may go and do testing in a particular area 
and maybe provide even free testing to try to build up the pool of a particular background. But generally speaking, these tests that they're selling, they're going to go to anybody and everybody. And it is what it is when you get the results. So then the question might be, well, do any of these companies have a much larger pool of Galician heritage of the people who are testing? Well, it's possible that some companies may have larger pools than other in terms of the total test taken. But the thing is that DNA, again, the market's changed a bit. So remember back in the day when GEDmatch first came on the scene, that was really exciting. And they offered a place for particularly genealogists to come and upload their results. And, and oftentimes you could tap into other people who had tested, because if you had tested with Ancestry and somebody else tested with 23andMe, you're not comparing to the same pool, right? You had separate pools that your results were matched against. So people would put into GEDmatch and hope that there'd be some cross-pollination there between people who had tested with different companies. Well, I recently, for the January episode of Family Tree Magazine podcast, interviewed Diane Southerd. And we were talking about GEDmatch, but she kind of helped really explain this phenomenon of how these pools within each company has evolved. I want to play that soundbite for you. The testing companies became more competitive. And so, for example, Family Tree DNA saw Ancestry taking a lot of the market share. And so they started offering essentially the same service that JetMatch was offering. And they said, hey, you tested Ancestry? Bring your data here and we'll put it into our database for free. And you can match with other people. This was a huge breakthrough and actually a pretty good idea because once you got into Family Tree DNA, Family Tree DNA was offering other services like wire mitochondrial DNA testing. It it seemed like a really, really good idea. And so when MyHeritage came on the scene, MyHeritage was like, let's offer to let anybody join our database for free. And again, no matter where you were tested, you give your data to MyHeritage, they build their database, you get free access. It's a win-win. So as transferring became a norm and as DNA testing prices came down, GEDmatch became less important, less necessary, because most people who've taken a DNA test have tested either at 23andMe or at Ancestry. They're the two biggest databases. If those people are savvy enough to know how to transfer their data, they've probably transferred to MyHeritage or to Family Tree DNA. And then you don't need GEDmatch. GEDmatch no longer is a place where you can go to find new matches. So in today's genetic genealogy world, you're not as likely to find really unique pools at different companies. Of course, the one exception to that that I would think of is that some pools are bigger than others, right? Ancestry's pool is really big. All of the people who are non-genealogists, they're curious about their background, but they don't take it any further. So This whole idea of downloading your raw data and uploading it to other sites, that's not even on their radar. So still, you're going to see there are unique qualities to each company's um, testing pool. And you definitely want to try and be in as many pools as you possibly can. But the ultimate answer is there isn't one that's going to be focused on a particular area like Galician heritage. Um, The second thing is he had a question about where to find Galician records and genealogical information. Now, that's a new area for me. I don't have that background. So my approach to how do I find records for a whole new area of research is I would go to the Family Search Wiki at familysearchwiki.org and I would type in the location and do a search. And I found that they had a, a lot of consolidated information about Galician genealogical resources. So that was a great place to go. And then of course, your next stop is Google, right? So I ran a search on Galician Spanish genealogy. And then I put Galicia in quotation marks to make that location mandatory. And I'll have a link in the show notes to the results that I got, because you'll find that there were several great results. Guess what? The first result was the Family Search Wiki and their page uh, devoted to Galicia. So there are resources out there. And then, of course, it's all about uh, you can go and search some of those top sites like MyHeritage, Ancestry, Family Search, Family Search for sure, because that's totally free. But you can search the other ones 
even if you don't have a subscription, and find out what they've got. And of course, one of my favorite places to go is Google Books. And I would search in Google Books, not only in English, but perhaps in Spanish as well, particularly if you speak Spanish, <laughs> that would make it easier. But you can always use Google Translate to help you out. And that's built into Google Books as well. So that's just a few ideas on how to um, make sure that you're hitting everything that's available on the web, at least currently. And of course, you could wrap that search up at the end of the day with setting up a Google Alert. So you never know, my gosh, even if it's kind of slim pickings right now on the web, it could be that in two weeks, some fabulous new website pops up and, and has just the kinds of records and information that you need. Google Alerts will bring that to your attention. If you want to learn more about that, that's what my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, is all about. And we have several comprehensive video classes in Genealogy Gems Premium. Let me tell you, we'll take your Googling to a whole nother level for genealogy in both the video classes in premium membership and the book. All right, next up here from Linda. She says, I'm a regular listener to your podcast and I'm the family historian. I recently received a trove of documents from my uncle who had been working to chart the family for 25 years. He passed away last year. His most recent quest was to find as many old family pictures as possible and I have continued to reach out to distant relatives. I enjoyed the recent podcast about the New York Photographer's website and hope it will help me identify people in some of these very old pictures. Now, the podcast episode that she is talking about, in episode 236, I interviewed David Lowe, who was the specialist for the photography collection at the New York Public Library, and they have a fabulous free tool. So if you want to check it out, I will have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, Linda goes on to say her question. A friend of mine has inherited all of her family's old family pictures. The pictures are from the late 1800s. She doesn't know who most of the people are. She's not interested in learning, and apparently there aren't any members of the family who have taken the role of family historian. Is there anything to do with these pictures other than to dispose of them? It makes me so sad to know that no one is interested. When I learned a branch of my family tree had tossed all of their old family pictures, I felt awful, and it has taken me some time to accept that I might not ever find replacements for this branch. Well, Linda, first, thank you. I'm so glad you're enjoying the podcast. There are ways to make real progress identifying photos. So, you know, you hate to kind of see or give up right away, although it sounds like your friend really isn't inter interested either way, but you might be interested in doing a little bit to just help identify the right place to give the pictures to. Now, this is the topic that I'm actually doing a brand new presentation on. Uh, I'm going to be debuting it at Roots Tech 2020. And then shortly thereafter, you'll be reading more about it here at Genealogy Gems, and I will have a brand new premium video as well. But for now, what I would do is I would ask your friend to write down all the states, the counties, the towns the locations where she thinks her family lived, as well as have her write down direct ancestors as far back as she knows them, even if it's just her grandparents or to her great grandparents. And with some basic genealogical information on the most recent members of the family and some possible locations, then you could post them on deadfred.com. Now this is a website where people upload unidentified old photos and then other people come and they search for families and locations and they look at these old photos and see if they can identify who they are. Maybe figure out that, oh, this is somebody from my family. You would be shocked how many photos have made their way to family historians because of the deadfred.com website. If you do at least know the county where some of the photos came from, then you could offer them up to the local genealogical society in that county. Uh, if you don't have time to post them on deadfred.com, maybe that society would be willing to take them. And, and oftentimes they'll have volunteers who would love to take on a project like that. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get the photos into the hands of a family historian somewhere in your friend's family tree who would just be so grateful to get them? because I agree with you. It is such a shame to toss them because you can be sure there is someone out there who would absolutely treasure them. And if that seems like a long shot, 
this idea of somehow taking what starts as a completely unidentified photograph and not only kind of figuring out more about the picture, but getting it into the hands of a relation of that person. If that seems kind of far-fetched, well, I've got a great story for you. Coming up next, our first gem is that mystery story. It is a story that will absolutely breathe new life into your, your hopes and your belief that it is possible when you think something is completely lost, never to be seen again, surprises do happen. And that's coming up next. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. So in this gem, I promised you a a tremendous mystery story. And this came to me at the Genealogy Roots event that I did in St. George, Utah in January of this year, 2020. Bill Compton attended the event and he came in and he shared this story with me. And when I heard it, I said, oh my gosh, Bill, we got to get you to record this and share it with our listeners. And it's just a fabulous, mysterious tale that just goes in so many different directions. So, But also it was just so inspiring to think that something like a, a treasured family scrapbook that appears to be absolutely completely lost could come back to the family again, decades into the future. So I want to introduce to you, Bill Compton. In 1974, when my father died, he designated in his will many family possessions to my sister, Anne, who lived in Birmingham, Alabama. As she and I were the only children in our family, we decided to split up the responsibilities of family history and genealogy research. I would take my mother and her information, and Anne would take our father. Among the many items that Anne had received was a black scrapbook of newspaper articles about William R. Compton, our grandfather, who was appointed the U.S. Marshal for Northern and Western New York State by Presidents McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. These had been collected and saved by our grandmother, Helen Tubbs Compton, until his death in 1912. Anne had the 82 pages in the scrapbook laminated and rebound. She also had many photographs of our Compton line ancestors restored, duplicated, and sent to me. During her years in Alabama, she did extensive microfilm research on the Compton side of the family. On January 16, 1988, she was featured in an article in the Church News, a publication of news and human interest stories of the LDS Church, about her research, despite her many medical problems. Soon after this article appeared, it had been read by Dixie in Plano, Texas, distributors of herbal products. Dixie and her husband contacted her and explained that these products might help her medical conditions. 
Anne left Alabama shortly thereafter and moved in with them, and became an herbal distributor as well. In 1989, Dixie moved to Oregon, and Anne decided to move to Desert Hot Springs, California. Dixie planned to rent a storage unit in Oregon. As Anne had no place of her own to store her personal possessions, she asked Dixie if she could take her things with her and store them until such time as Anne could get settled and have a place of her own. In addition to the many personal items of Anne's, most of the memorabilia items of our father and his parents, including the scrapbook, were transferred to Oregon. In 1996, Anne had heard from Dixie that they were moving and would no longer need their storage unit. They had transferred the storage items several times to different localities in Oregon over the seven-year interval. After requesting access, she and a close friend drove to Oregon. Anne told me at the time that she found many of the boxes were missing and what remained had been crushed with broken items inside. She salvaged what she could and after returning to Desert Hot Springs, she was able to send me a number of the remaining Compton items, but said all the rest were either lost or destroyed, including the scrapbook. Now we'll fast forward 17 years later. On June 12, 2013, Donald Clark, living in Butte Creek Canyon in Northern California near Centerville, shot and killed three Sacramento residents at his property. A mother and her teenage son and another teenage friend had stolen a car, driven up to Mr. Clark's property, and he shot them with a 12-gauge pump shotgun as they approached his home. He then put them in their car, along with a bicycle and a can of gasoline, drove seven miles further into the mountains, set the car on fire, and then biked back home. He was shortly thereafter arrested. During his trial, it was testified that he had moved to the property in 1998 as a caretaker for the property owner who lived in Southern California. It had previously been a boy's ranch over a hundred years ago, but all that was left were a few buildings and sheds, one of which Clark lived in with no electricity or running water. He was described as a scavenger and a hoarder, who would collect and reuse, resell or take apart, and recycle items. He was described as having everything under the sun. He was sentenced to prison for life without parole. After the property was vacated in June 2013, another man, John, settled on the property as a caretaker. He had been living on the property only about a month when on August 31, 2013, a vegetation fire burned 80 acres, including all the buildings and scattered piles of debris and junk. After the fire, the property owner in Southern California wanted to sell the Butte Creek Canyon property and asked John to leave. He and his girlfriend, Tanya, attempted to clean up and salvage what remained, taking it to nearby Chico, California. They couldn't afford a storage unit, so they decided they would just get rid of it. A girlfriend of Tanya's, Laura, got wind of the situation and after looking through the stuff found some collectible baseball cards, among other things, and a newspaper scrapbook. Laura told Tanya, you can't get rid of this. This is somebody's life. So some of the items were kept by Laura and the rest were destroyed. After keeping them for several years, in 2018, Laura was cleaning her home and decided to do something about the collected items. She went to eBay and on other websites to find out what the baseball cards were worth and decided to also try and find someone who might be interested in the scrapbook. Doing a Google search for a William R. Compton who died in Elmira, New York in 1912, which was described in a newspaper obituary included in the scrapbook, she came across my blog website, Compton Haynes Ancestral Nuggets. I started this blog in 2016 after I took a class at a family history convention in St. George, Utah. 
the blog had posts and pictures about William R. Compton, my grandfather. As my email contact was listed on the blog, she sent me an email on December 29, 2018, writing, Dear Mr. Compton, I have your grandfather's scrapbook. I have been wanting to get this to you. She gave me her phone number, and after I called her and confirmed that she did indeed have the missing scrapbook, she mailed it to me. I received the package a couple of weeks later, and upon opening the package, I found the scrapbook of newspaper articles in near pristine condition. No pages were burned, and it had no lingering smell. It had survived for over 44 years after my father died. It had been missing from the family for 30 years. The whereabouts of the scrapbook from 1989 in Oregon to being in the possession of Mr. Clark in 2013 is unknown. How it got from Oregon to Northern California, I have no idea. Then a triple murder. Then a fire. Perhaps it was inside an old junked refrigerator or other metal appliance. Then to have it salvaged and for Laura to have saved it from a dumpster, recognizing its possible worth. Then for Laura to take the initiative to go on the internet to track down a family member who might want it. And if I had not started a family history blog, I would not have this scrapbook today, as she never would have found me. There are so many what ifs in this story that I still can't wrap my head around it. It was like receiving manna from heaven and a true miracle. Thank you so much, Bill, for sharing your story. I love hearing the stories of my students and my listeners and my readers in their own voice. There's nothing like it. Um, I can hear your passion for it. It's absolutely phenomenal. And it certainly gives me renewed hope. And you know, there's actually a book in the Cook family. It's it's a red book. I don't know that it's a, I think it's a bit of a scrapbook. But I remember my mother in law telling me about this book, and that it had all this family information in it. And there were some photos and things. And it has just disappeared. And when I heard Bill Compton's story, I thought, you never know, maybe that thing will come back around. And what a testament to the value of having your own genealogy blog. Oh, I know so many of you heard me talk about it here on the show. And I've heard from many of you that you've had similar kinds of situations where people have found your blog, it popped up in a Google search, and they reached out to you and the treasures just came from there. If you've been on the fence about whether or not to, to try that, you know, it's not hard these days. A blog is basically a simple website where the articles are published in chronological order. That's it. That's what, what it means. And you could even just simply post one article if you wanted to. Maybe just copy a lot of the research that you've done out of your database, maybe in a narrative format, Post that, put a couple pictures, and invite people who find you to comment or to reach out to you. I think Bill was brilliant that he had his email address on his blog. Many people kind of do the anonymous thing, but that kind of undermines the, the potential for those connections that could be made and somebody who could say, oh my gosh, I have all your grandma's pictures uh, and letters in my grandma's scrapbook and I want to share. So Consider doing a blog if you want to learn more about how to do that. Google has a free blog that you can use, blogger.com. And on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash genealogy gems, I have a couple of videos there that will kind of walk you through the process. They're a little older, but it's still essentially the same. It hasn't changed a whole lot. And it's so worth getting your story out there so that it can pop up in those Google search results for other researchers. Coming up right after this, we're going to go from the mystery of the lost scrapbook to the mystery of the lost page of a love letter. Are 
Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And MyHeritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. I call this gem the love letter. It's a story that I came across online. It's actually, it wasn't actually a story. It was an announcement that Kathleen Ackerman, who is the director of the Cave Creek, Arizona Family History Center, was going to be speaking at a genealogy society and telling this story about the mystery of a love letter in her family history papers. So I reached out to Kathleen and she said she'd be happy to share it with all of us here on the podcast. Kathleen Ackerman graduated from BYU with a Bachelor of General Studies Family History degree in 2012, and she now has her own research company. It's called Finding Ties That Bind. This is kind of an interview, but it's kind of not. Um, I kind of kicked off the conversation. I interject once or twice, but pretty much this is Kathleen's story to tell. So here we go. Hi, Kathleen. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Considering the Valentine's Day is just around the corner. I thought, how wonderful to bring a love story to the Genealogy Gems podcast. And that's what you were going to be telling uh, the society about. Where did this story first come from? It was from a letter that was written that my mother found among my grandparents' papers. Wow. So she kind of gave it to you and you started Mm -hmm. to do research. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like there was a mystery behind all of this. There there was. It was about... 2010. And I was going to school earning my bachelor's degree in genealogy and family history through BYU's online program. And so my mom knew I had a great interest in that. And when she found the letter, it wasn't complete. So we only had three pages, there was no signature on the pages. So we didn't know who wrote the letter. And it was addressed to a girl named Mamie. And we didn't know who that was either. So that's basically all I had to work with. Wow. Well, I'm going to sit back and relax. And I'd love for you to tell us more about this story. I might have a few questions along the way, but tell us how this all unfolded. Okay. So like I said, my mother called me and had this letter that she had found and kind of read it to me a little bit over the phone. Um, I told her, well, ask grandpa if he knows who Mamie is. And um, my grandmother had um, passed away several years earlier. And we knew it was on my dad's side because it was among my paternal grandparents' papers that they had been working with. My grandfather was sick and starting to have a little dementia. So he did not know anything about the letter, didn't remember anybody named Mamie. My dad had never heard of anybody with that name growing up. So I kind of set the letter to one side, hoping that I would figure out how to figure it out because I was very new to researching um, and wasn't for sure where to go from from there. So before I I get into more of that, I would like to just read the letter because it's just, I think it's just darling. It's just really, really cute. I would love it. It was addressed small Idaho, written February 20th, 1910. And it says, my dear Mamie, your most welcome letter received yesterday and I was glad to hear from you and your Valentine. It was the sweetest one I have ever seen. Mamie, I would not take anything for it. I am glad it came from you. It reminds me of my little brown-eyed girl, and I also received your card at the same time. It looks clear to you that I didn't get your letter sooner, but the mail from the lodge to Reno only goes three times a week, and this letter can't go until Tuesday unless I get it to small some other way. But I think we will have a daily again. There's getting to be so many people. 
I am sorry I cannot send you a valentine, but I have not been away from the ranch for nearly two months. Could not get away very well. The stock had to have good care, so I had to see that they got it. It is quite cold now. Don't know when it is going to quit, but we have plenty of hay. I wish some other people had it. It is about out. Dan and I butchered a bunch of hogs yesterday, and we put ten more in to fatten today. I would like to be with you tonight for a while. I would like to have you cook my meals. I think I would get fat. Do you think you would like it? If you would, Mamie, I think we both would be happy. I don't think we ever will get angry with each other. Do you? I hope not, at least. I think we will know each other well enough by midsummer, and I will have everything fixed up pretty well then, so I can care for my little sweetheart if she will let me. You mentioned noises. They are getting along well, I guess. They are living with her mother. Relations are getting quite thick, don't you think? She got her a bay to take home to mother. Don't know how happy they are, but hope they do well. Jesse is on Snake River feeding sheep for his brother. Warren is not home. He is in. And then the letter stops. So that was three handwritten pages of the letter. And that was all that we had. Oh, Kathleen, I love that letter. I love all the little details in it. And yet you can tell this is a a gentleman who's um, thinking about the future. What did you think when you first read that letter? I loved how he called her my little brown eyed girl. I yes. Just that is so sweet. And just that he was working hard, trying to get things ready so that they could marry. And it was just, just adorable. In fact, I shared it. I have two daughters at the time they were 12 and 14. So of course they were just enthralled with the letter and, and, Oh, who could have written it and what happened and how do we figure this out? And they'd come home from school and did you figure things out yet, mom? And, you know, it's, it was just really fun for our whole family. In fact, my boys were older. They were, would have been 17 and 19. And uh, I think they were a little bit interested in the story too. <laughs> oh, you've got to love that. Okay, so there's a lot of intrigue in your house. Yeah. What did you do next to kind of discover more about this? So I, actually, I kind of set it aside for a little while, because I really honestly didn't know what to do. Um, I knew I had some clues in the letter, but without having any idea who Mamie was, I, I just didn't really know where to go with it. So um, it was actually kind of luck that for one of my courses for my degree, I was researching my research project was my great grandparents. I started with them. They were in southeast Idaho and they had settled there. My third great grandfather had originally settled in Annis, Idaho. And so I was doing a three generation study starting with my great grandparents. And I found my great grandmother on the 1900 census. And right above her listed on the census was Mamie. And she was eight years old in 1900. And my heart just leapt. I was like, this is Mamie. It could be Mamie. She was eight in 1900, which would put her 18 in 1910. So I thought, wow, this this really could be her. She's the right age to be sending Valentines and receiving Valentines. So I, I got the letter back out. I transcribed it. I looked through it to figure out, okay, what exactly, what all, what are all the clues that I have in the letter that's going to help me? Kind of made a list of those of things, um, when it was written, where it was written, the towns that it mentioned, that type of thing. So then I kept going on my census study. I went to 1910 and found, I actually found what I believe to be Mamie twice. She was listed first on the 4th of May, listed under the name of Marion Smith, living in Medicine Lodge, Idaho, working as a servant. On May 9th, when the census was taken in Manan, which is close to Annis, where my that family is, she was listed with her family, again, as Marion, right above um, my great-grandmother, Ruby. So, so was, is that how you knew that the Marion who was a servant was likely Mamie because you find a Marion with the right family? Yes. So I had the Marion who was the same age to be Mamie. So kind of <clears throat> assuming Mamie was the nickname. And then I wasn't sure if it was Marion Smith obviously was the same one in Medicine Lodge as the one listed with the family. 
because the census was five days apart, it was it's possible that she was actually home when the census was taken, or it's possible that her parents just listed her, even though she wasn't actually in the household at the time, that she could still have been up in Medicine Lodge. There's not a, a great distance between the places, and it's all southeast Idaho. But I, at that point, I, you know, I wasn't positive that it was my Mamie, you know. Right. It, it was all coming together because because she was there in Medicine Lodge. Um, and it wasn't until I decided that I would kind of start figuring out where she was. In the letter, we have three places mentioned. So we have small Idaho, we have Reno, which at the time I assumed was Reno, Nevada, which really didn't make sense. And then we have Medicine Lodge. So I Googled small Idaho and on Google Maps, and there was nothing there. And I realized that maybe it was just not in existence anymore. So I found um, the historical maps, Dave Rumsey's historical maps, and found a 1909 map for southeast Idaho, um, Fremont County at the time, and studied that map. And I could see on there the town of Small. I could see Medicine Lodge Creek. There wasn't an actual town called Medicine Lodge. So I, I'm i thinking it was more of like an area where there were ranchers and farms and, and things like that, that it was not an actual town because there isn't, it isn't on the map. And then there is also not far away a Reno, Idaho, which I had never known about. So that made sense as far as the letter goes, because I was finding all three of those places in Fremont County relatively close together. So I knew that I had found exactly where the um, letter was written and, and where it was happening from. And I was pretty sure I had the right person. It just made sense that, you know, the Mamie was 18 by 1910, and she was working in Medicine Lodge, which is in the small Idaho area. So she was in the right area at the right time to have met someone and fallen in love. So I decided, okay, if this is, if this is Mamie, let's see when they married. Um, they wanted to marry in midsummer. BYU-Idaho has a database, the Western States Marriage Database, and I went there and found a marriage of a Marion Smith to a man called William Patelzik. They had married in the 12th of December, 1910, and it was in Bingham County, which is was the county south of Fremont at the time in Blackfoot. Um, it kind of confused me. I'm not for sure why they would have gone south to marry, why they wouldn't have married in Fremont County, I I don't know. So I kind of got thinking maybe they eloped. I took the marriage record and searched the two witnesses on census records, and they both worked at the courthouse. So th- it was not family members that was witnessing the marriage, and they went to the county south of where they were living to get married. So I've always kind of thought maybe that they eloped. I don't have proof of that, but it, I just I, that's what I kind of think may have happened. They married, you know, in December, not in, in the summer, but sometimes things take longer. So that wasn't that surprising, you know, what I thought. And so I went back to the census records and I thought, okay, let's find William. Let's make sure he was in the right area at the right time. Um, and he was, I found him living in Medicine Lodge with his family. In 1910, he was 23 years old, and he was working on his father's farm. So there he was, right at the right area at the right time to be the author of the letter. And I was pretty sure that he was the one had written to my great-grand-aunt is who she is. Um, her name is, is kind of a mystery, her given name. We know she went by, by Mimi. On several records, she's Marion with an N, but on several others, she's Miriam. So we're really not for sure if she if she was Miriam or Miriam. There's no birth record that I have found for her that, but she's she's listed as both in several places. So I continue searching for information from her. Um, my mom went through now that we knew kind of who she was. Went through some more of my grandparents' papers. She found a photograph of her. And she also found her obituary. So sadly, 
Mamie passed away only after being married for four months. So in April of 1911, she had appendicitis. Um, They performed surgery, but she did not make it. So in her obituary, it talks about her living in small Idaho where she met and married William Patelzik. At the hospital in Idaho Falls, five days after an operation for appendicitis had been performed to save her life, Mamie Smith Patelzik, a bride of four months, was called to her final rest after severe suffering. She was a former resident of Lehigh, Utah, where she was loved and respected by all who knew her. In that city, she was a faithful worker for the church in which she held several offices before she removed with her folks to Annis, Idaho. She went to small Idaho where she met and married William Patelzik. During her illness, she requested the elders to administer her each day for which she received much comfort. At last, they administered to her and asked God that if she could not be spared to her loved ones, that she might go in peace as she was suffering. In less than five minutes after this last prayer had been offered, she passed away. She was greatly beloved by all who knew her. She was aged 20 years. So that really brought my family down. We were pretty sad that here was this beautiful letter, this love story, and Mamie passed away after only being married for four months. She is buried in the Little Butte Cemetery in Annis, um, where both my grandparents, my great-grandparents, lots of family are are buried. And there is a headstone there with her that looks relatively new. I'm not sure when it was placed, but on the headstone itself, it has Miriam. Um, is not Mary N with an N. It's spelled Miriam. So it's like I said, we're not really for sure, but she did go by Mamie from everybody that that knew her. But we were all happy that I had solved the mystery. That um, we we knew what had happened to Mamie. We had a photograph of her, which she was just really pretty. If you could see a picture of her, she was just lovely. So. I put the letter away. I moved on with my classwork. I, you know, was pretty happy with myself because I was new to this research thing and I'd followed through with a research plan and I'd done census records, maps, newspaper, vital records. I'd done all the, the right things that you do when you're when you're researching someone. So I was pretty excited. And then, I don't know, probably a couple months later, it had been a little while, I received a phone call from my mother. And she was so excited because she had found the last page of the love letter. It was folded up, tucked away in a random file in my grandparents' things. We have no idea how the letter got separated or anything, but she was very excited. So I'm like, oh, mom, you have to read me the letter. You know, tell me what what the last page said. So I will go ahead and read to you the last page. I'll start on the end of page four, the beginning of the sentence, where it says, Warren is not home. He is in Medicine Lodge riding for horses that we have out on the desert. But of course, if he was here, he would send his best regards. You can tell the little broadbent girl that I am glad she is kind to you. Well, Mamie, I have to get this letter down to Blue Creek to put it in the mail, and it is seven miles the way I have to go now. So I will have to hurry to get back before dark. I will bring my letter to a close for now this time. Write soon, yours, and it is signed Frank Sullivan. So my mom read that, and I said, what? And she says, yeah. And I says, mom, Frank Sullivan? And she says, yeah. And I says, don't you remember who made me married? And she's like, no. And I said, she married William. And so we both just started laughing, and I was like, that love letter was not written by William. It was written by a man named Frank Sullivan. So it was just such a shock, and I, I just couldn't believe it, that between the time that the letter was written in February and December, she had obviously met William, fallen in love with William after she had already been exchanging letters with Frank and ended up marrying William. So it was kind of a surprise, and my girls, of course, were positive that there was some love triangle going on. They worked this up really well in in their (laughs) minds. Um, (laughs) Of course, we don't really know, but I did go back to census records. I'm like, okay, so let's find out about Frank. What was going on with this, this Frank? And in 1910, he was living in Medicine Lodge. He was 28 years old. He had his own farm. 
and he was living with his two brothers, Dennis and Warren, and they are both mentioned in the letters. So he mentions Warren being in Medicine Lodge, and he mentions butchering hogs with Den, who I would assume is, is Dennis. So that's all matching up between the letter and the census records that, that match. So I was pretty sure I had the right Frank, and I thought, okay, so what happened to poor old Frank? He'd been jilted in 1910 by Mamie, and um, I searched in 1920 and found that he did marry in 1919. So he, he did eventually find someone else and marry. William, I researched him a little bit more. And in 1914, three years after Mamie passed away, he remarried a young widow who had two small children and they went on to have several children of their own. So it kind of was, you know, for the men, at least it was a relatively happy ending. They both married and, and had families. But now we know the full story of the love letter. Um, I, of course, don't know what happened in between February and December that changed Mamie's mind. Um, I find it interesting that she, like I said, she had went down to the other county to get married without any family there as witnesses. So maybe the family didn't didn't like William. I, I don't know. You could build a whole story around it, but but we just don't know. I personally think that her name is Miriam because... That's what's on her headstone, and family would have made that. You know, I was maybe her sisters, maybe even my great grandmother was involved in putting a headstone for her. So I, I call her Miriam, and know that you know it was just interesting to see that in these ranch lands in southeast Idaho that she had two suitors, and like I said before, she was a beautiful young girl, young lady. And so it's not that surprising that a couple of ranchers would have fallen in love with her. Um, Oh, absolutely. I I love the picture that you have of her. We'll have it in the in the show notes section, because she's just lovely and looks so relaxed. And she looks like she's considering her options. (laughs) (laughs) It is a lovely picture of her. I was very excited, you know, when my mom found it, and we knew who, who to look for. Um, And I think through all of this, through all the research and everything that I learned through that, I think the most, one of the most important things that I learned new as a new researcher was that we just can't assume we know everything. We have to be open to new possibilities, to new research, to new evidence, to things that come along because, you know, I had closed the book on it. I was so sure that I knew the full story of what had happened to Mamie in her short 20 years. And lo and behold, there was this big surprise that there was someone else involved in the story that I had no idea. So um, we just need to always keep open to the possibilities of new evidence and, and new research and, and don't ever think that, that we know everything there is to know because we don't. <laughs> Well, I think that's a, a really great lesson. You're right. I mean, it, it'd be so easy just to conclude where you left off. As a researcher, professionally, you're doing research for other people. Do you find yourself getting as pulled in to the stories, even when it's not your own family? Absolutely. I really do. Um, in fact, sometimes when I just do a small research project for someone and they're, they're, they don't want to move on or, you know, for whatever reason, I find myself just thinking, no, but I don't know everything. I, I want to know more. It's hard for me not to research all their lines and everything because I just, I do. I just love reading about people and finding out about people's lives. So um, it's very enjoyable for me, even when it's not my own family. Absolutely. And I'm curious about your kids. You know, they saw this start out as this mystery and spread out from there. Have any of them kind of continue to show an interest in genealogy or helped you with any other future projects? Um, They haven't necessarily helped. They are interested. They love to hear the stories that I find. Um, I've done a lot of research on my husband's line in England um, and Scotland. Um, In fact, the day that I mentioned that they had a Scottish ancestor, they have one, and my husband's great-grandparents are from Scotland. They were just like, oh, we didn't know that. And, you know, it was so cool that they had Scottish. And, you know, so they very much have interest in the things that I find. Um, But they're busy right now in college and with their young families and their own lives. So they haven't followed the actual research bug. But um, they definitely do show interest in everything that I'm finding. So that's fun. 
Oh, absolutely. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you do as a researcher, where you're located, and maybe how people can tap into your uh, consulting services. Okay. Um, I'm located in Cave Creek, Arizona. Um, we've lived here for about seven and a half years. Um, I'm currently also going back to school through the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, they have an online master's program for genealogy, so I'm in the middle of that right now. So I don't take a lot of clients just because I'm trying to focus, of course, on finishing my schooling, but I do, um, I do still, still take them. Well, Kathleen, I so appreciate you sharing this story, this love story with all of us. And I hope we can have you back soon on the Genealogy Gems podcast. Thank you. If you have a story that you'd like to share, I'd like to hear it. And I bet you other people here on the podcast would send me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can send it through our website. Just click contact on the homepage at genealogygems.com and let me know what your story is. Give me some of the details why you think it would be of interest to folks here on the podcast. And perhaps we will have you telling your story here on Genealogy Gems. Well, thank you so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 238. We solved a lot of mysteries. We did a lot of Googling. And speaking of Googling, that's what my big announcement is. I'm so happy to let you know that the third edition of the Genealogist Google Toolbox is now available. So this is my book. Uh, It came out, I don't even remember what, 2010 was the first edition. And we've done uh, the second edition. We did a 2019 kind of mini update. This is a really big revamped 2020 third edition. And I think you're going to love it. I hope so. I loved writing it. There are a couple of brand new chapters in this book that I am so excited about. I think it's going to make a huge difference in your family history work and your genealogy. And of course, we've I've completely rewritten the um, search section, because let me tell you, a lot has changed. You know, we talked about change is inevitable. In fact, I'll read to you the introduction to the book. In a letter to Jean Baptiste Leroy in 1789, Benjamin Franklin declared, quote, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes, unquote. While I'm hesitant to challenge this founding father, the United States, I think we must complete the triad of certainty and add change to the list. Anyone who has used a computer knows that change is a constant and sometimes, okay, usually frustrating occurrence. It's guaranteed that just when you think you know how things work, some tech giant goes and changes everything. This technological change is probably the number one complaint I hear from genealogists. And yet it's constant change that has pulled us from the pencil and paper days of letter writing for a record and waiting for a month for a reply to the convenient instant gratification of searching for and downloading that record in the time it takes to order a latte at Starbucks. Of course, all of this certain change puts me in a bit of predicament as a genealogical technical writer. By the time I identify a topic, do my research, write, edit, and get ready to flip the switch on publishing, things can change. And a lot has changed since 2011 when I wrote the first edition of the Genealogist Google Toolbox and the second edition in 2015, and the update in 2019. It's easy to feel cranky about such inconvenient changes, but what's the alternative? Do we really want our genealogy research to stagnate? I know I don't. The staggering growth of available online databases, the ever-evolving web platforms, all of this technological evolution has continually opened new avenues of pursuit in our quest for the answers to our family's past. It's actually a thrilling time to be a family historian, and Google is still the best search engine for finding what you are looking for. We've got ancestors to find and stories to tell, and this newest edition is chock full of the most up-to-date information available to assure search success. 
And that leads into all new chapters on my Google search methodology, um, updates to other tools within the toolbox. A few of them haven't changed a whole lot, but we've got brand new chapters for you. I am re-energized. <laughs> I was kind of wondering, do I really want to write another you know, update to, to Google? Maybe I should do a different topic. But then I started really doing my, my in-depth research again, and I thought, this, this, this is too good to not do this. The innovations, what it can do for genealogy is staggering, and um, I'm excited to write about it and to share it with you. So the Genealogist Google Toolbox, third edition, is available. It's now in the Genealogy Gems store. Now, if you're listening to this, and when this episode comes out in February of 2020, you'll find a pre-order sale going on. It's a very short time, and then we're going to go launch it officially at Roots Tech. And you'll be seeing an ebook version coming shortly thereafter. It's been a busy time. We've got so many exciting things to do this year in 2020 and beyond. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.